Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for compost tea for your garden with the Bee Chicas. I'm Kathy Lane, Programs, Events, and Outreach Coordinator with the Boulder Public Library. Before we begin, I want to go over some housekeeping. First, this event is being recorded and will be available on Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel after today, so you can watch again and let your friends know about this workshop. All of our online events are an extension of library services to which library conduct of policies apply in our online space as well. If you enjoy this presentation, we have more upcoming virtual programs. Please visit our website at boulderlibrary.org for our full virtual events calendar. This event is part of Summer of Discovery, our annual celebration of reading and this year virtual programs for kids, teens, and adults. Visit boulderlibrary.org slash summer to register. I'd like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this and so many of our events. Finally, at any time during this event, you can post your questions in the chat. You can log into Google or YouTube account and simply post your questions. We will address these at later question and answer points during the presentation and at the end. My colleagues, Celine Cooper and Adam Watts are in the background operating our broadcast behind the scenes. Boulder Public Library and City of Boulder have been working with the Bee Chicas since 2015 for seed to table workshops and they take care of the library beehives on the roof. So for this workshop, Compost Tea for Your Garden, it's part of our seed to table programming because they feel healthy soils equals a healthy planet. I would like to introduce the four Bee Chicas. We have Tracy Bell Humer, Teresa Beck, Deborah Foy and Cynthia Scott. Bee Chicas, I want to thank you for adapting the in-person workshop you would have been offering in person to a virtual experience. Over to you, Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Beck, and these this is a picture of the four of us at our annual pollinator. Family Bee Boulder Festival, which we are not going to be able to put on in Central Park in Boulder this year, but we'll be doing some virtual events online for that um, event. So um, we are. Um, um, does uh, Deborah, do you want to speak to this slide about what we do in the Bee Chicas? Sure. So we, as Kathy said, we've been together for a few years now and uh, we're pollinator advocates and educators. We focus our time on helping people understand why pollinators are so important and how they can support them in their everyday lives. We do that through the beehives at the library, through programs at the library. We also visit elementary schools and we're each um, longtime beekeepers as well. Thank you. And our next slide is introducing our topic of compost tea, but I thought I would start out by uh, talking about what is compost. Um, compost is made much the same way as humus on a forest floor, but it is made much quicker. Um, there is layers of leaves and plant material that are broken down like in a deciduous forest with the help of water, air, microorganisms to create a nutrient rich material that plants thrive in. There's a couple ways to make compost. You can do a static pile, which is just putting a bin out and throwing in your kitchen scraps and um, grass clippings, leaves, but my recommended method would be a hot composting uh, method or a Berkeley method, which is more intensive, but um, it is, you get the temperature up so that the pathogens um, and the seeds uh, are uh, pretty much eliminated if it goes to like 150 to 160 in a hot composting method. So next slide. So good reasons to use compost. What compost does is it adds organic matter to the soil um, and that, then it creates a really good soil structure to help roots grow because there's more air in the soil. And what I like to do is the no dig method where I put the compost around vegetables or around the um, plants 
so that the earthworms come up and they actually do the digging for you and create that really great soil structure. It adds life in the form of microorganisms, which create um, micronutrients for the plants. It helps retain water, which is important in our Colorado climate. And then there are less needs for fertilizers because the plants are healthier and less under attack from pests and diseases. It's actually not a fertilizer, but it activates in the soil um, all of the things that help the plants to grow better. Next slide. <laughs> So now we're gonna talk about compost tea. Um, this past winter, I took a course from Gaia College in British Columbia. Um, it was an organic master gardening program that I got certified in. And I learned about uh, aerated compost tea. Um, compost tea has been around for a long time and there's a difference between compost tea and, and compost brews. Um, plant brews using just like nettle or comfrey or any of these nutrients or it, that are in plants would be different than, you, than making an aerated compost tea. So what I uh, have learned and what I do is I aerate the tea in a, with a bubbling system. Um, what it produces is our rich organic matter, which is, has a lot of enzymes um, that add a lot of beneficial microorganisms, including uh, beneficial bacteria, fungi, and protozoa that feeds the soil. It feeds the nematodes and the, the earthworms in the soil. And um, so that is what we're going to learn how to do today. So I'm going to, a little bit later, I'm gonna show you um, how to make compost tea and what the ingredients are, but, uh, and I'll show you the compost tea brewer, but it's important to brew the compost if you're using animal manure for 36 hours, which really multiplies all those beneficial microbes. And then the fermented non-aerobic teas with manure, called manure tea, are not recommended because people will steep the manure and then maybe you know stir stir it once in a while, but you can grow other um, anaerobic bacteria like E. coli, which would not be good to put on our plants or our vegetable gardens. There's a couple ways to um, apply compost tea. You can spray it over large areas, and I'll talk about that in a video. Um, or you can use it as a soil drench around trees and shrubs, just pouring it out in a bucket or putting it into a, as Tracy, um, who's one of the Bichicas, she's pouring it onto her plants with a, um, a not a sprayer, <laughs> with a flower uh, watering can. And I, I do it as a foliar spray on top and under the leaves, and you'll see that in, a, in an upcoming video. So um, what it does, as I described a little bit already, um, it does introduce these really good um, animals. They're basically microscopic animals and you're creating like a, a life-giving healthy soil. And why do we do this? Well, sometimes we're uh, working in a landscape that has been uh, disturbed, such as a construction landscape, new, new plantings, and um, so it's important to put these back in the soil. Um, you also wanna do use it if you, you know that there have been synthetic pesticides such as weed and feed or Roundup products, you know, glyphosate uh, used on the lawn or garden. So we want to reintroduce these good healthy microbes. A change in use from a forest to a meadow or a meadow to a forest ecosystem. What's interesting about um, these microorganisms is is that a meadow is basically bacterial um, microorganisms and a forest is uh, more of a fungal. So in the forest, you're gonna see mushrooms growing and, um, and then in the, in the meadows, there's uh, just a different makeup of, of microbes. And so also what we wanna do is to feed um, the existing soil and the plants to guard against pathogens because when you get healthy, colonized microorganisms on leaves that um, helps to 
keep out the pathogens and diseases on plants. So this is a compost tea recipe that I pulled off of the internet. I've com uh, combined it with, with what I do, and I got it from um, Earth Easy. So you take a five gallon bucket, you start with a five gallon bucket, and you put in um, about four to five gallons of non-chlorinated tap water. And I use rainwater, you'll see in the video, but you can also uh, put just tap water in, let it sit for 24 hours so that the chlorine can dissipate. Um, I use two cups of fully finished organic compost. And I use a combination of um, worm castings because I have two worm farms in our basement and I've got a lot of worm castings. So about a half a pound of worm castings mixed with well-aged cow manure or horse manure or sheep manure, whatever you can get. And then to feed those microbes, there's a lot of microorganisms that are in the compost already. Um, and to feed those microorganisms, you should put in a couple tablespoons of blackstrap molasses and mix that up real well. And then a, a, a couple uh, optional um, ingredients would be kelp uh, fertilizer, um, a tablespoon of that. Yeah, but I think it's really important to put kelp in. It, it just adds a lot of micronutrients that are in the sea that are that help to feed the, the, the healthy bacteria. And the other optional um, ingredients would be a, a teaspoon of liquid fish fertilizer, hydro, hydrolysate, fish hydrolysate, or EM1, which is a, it's right here, and I'm gonna show it to you on the, on the next um, uh, video. But this is a, a, a microbial inoculant that is um, developed for lawns and, and um, it's mostly lactobacillus and it's found all over the world. The ones that are in here are found um, worldwide. And I use that as a starter for the inoculant. And now we're gonna play a video on um, how we make it step-by-step. I'm Teresa Beck from the Bee Chicas. I'm wearing my coronavirus mask because we're in the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide and it's May 2020, but I'll take it off because we're definitely 10 feet apart and we're outside on this beautiful day. We are going to make aerated compost tea today. And so I have lots of ingredients here that I'll explain to you how I make my tea, starting with rainwater. I collect the rainwater from a rain barrel that I have in our house, and I pour the rainwater into a five-gallon bucket. And what you want to do is have non-chlorinated water. So you don't want to use tap water. If you do need to use tap water, you can uh, let it sit out for 12 to 24 hours so that the chlorine will dissipate. And then you can use it for compost tea. Because what we're doing is multiplying effective microorganisms in our tea by using a combination of manure. And I like to use worm castings that I have from my worm farm. And I use cow manure or horse manure that has been aged for at least two years. Um, and this is one I purchased, but I also have horse manure that I get from a friend's farm that has been aged five years. Also, what is essential in my compost tea is um, the organic molasses. I'm an organic gardener and try to use organic products. Um, kelp. This is liquid kelp. You can also buy it in a dry form and, and add water to it. And these products in the back are optional. I've used them in many of my teas. I've got sea minerals, um, a liquid fish, which is uh, very good for microorganisms. Um, this is called EM1 or EM, which is effective microorganisms. And I ordered that on the internet. I, this is a concentrated form, and I can activate this bottle of microorganisms with the molasses by using one tablespoon of that, one tablespoon of molasses, and a full bottle to 16 ounces of non-chlorinated water. And I let that sit out for a couple of weeks. Um, and Teresa, does that then... Um 
like mimic the purchased EM1? Is it the same yes, thing? Yes. Once I activate it with the molasses and l- let this sit for two months, or sorry, two weeks to, to one month in a warm place, oh. and you have to make sure that the top is off for the first 24 hours, mm-hmm. and then every couple days you kind of let the top off um, and then shake it up. And put it in a warm place, and that activates the microorganisms like, like and multiplies grows them, multiplies them. Multiplies them. So for the okay. price of one 16 ounce bottle, you can get 20 16 wow. ounce activated uh, effective microorganisms for adding to compost tea. So that's what we're going to start with. So first off, I'm going to come over here and use the worm castings from my worm farm, and I'm going to use two cups of worm castings in a mesh bag. Mesh is good because it won't uh, decompose with the microorganisms. So I I reuse these mesh bags. And then I'll put in a cup of cow manure. It's very well aged. You don't want to use fresh cow manure. And then I'll take this and tie it off with a zip tie that I recycled from my kitchen. It says organically grown from some vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I take that and I'll put it into the water. But before I do that, I'm going to add my molasses because I like to get it started with the food for the microorganisms. And some people will take the molasses and um, put it into some warm water, which will melt the molasses well. But I find that this works well. In so much water, It works fine. I also take a stick and mix it around really well. And the next thing I'm going to do, this is a PVC pipe. Um, The next thing I'm going to do is put in my kelp. So I do a tablespoon of the molasses and a tablespoon of kelp. This is a basic recipe, a little more than a tablespoon. Put that together. Then I'll drop in the manure into the bottom and add the aeration stone. This is an aquatic aerating stone that I put underneath. And I have a pump. And as you can see, with the manure, and the food from the for the microbes with the molasses and the sea kelp that will aerate for about 36 hours in a warm spot or 48 hours in um, if it's cold and around 50 degrees but if it's around 70 75 degrees and sometimes i put a heater on it so it goes faster but you it'll be ready in 36 to 48 hours if it's around 60 degrees And and then when she's back on, we can do more questions. To turn off the um, aquarium aerating stone, it's got that inside. And then we're going to strain this compost tea through a couple of strainers. What I like to do, I'm a beekeeper, and so I used to use these now for honey. Now I use them for compost tea. But I have a 600... Um, and a 400 and a 200 micro nylon film filter. And I start with the 600 on top because the 600 will collect most of the, the big stuff. Then I'll nest 400 underneath, and then I will nest the 200 underneath that to catch this a little bits because you don't want to clog up the sprayer. And if you don't have a filter set like this, you can use a nylon mesh bag, you can use pantyhose, there's all sorts of things you can do to filter um, the teeth. So also, the next thing I'm going to do is take out this bag of worm castings and cow manure. And if I had a really nice rose bush or something to set it by, it would be very happy, but I'm just going to put it over here. There's a grapevine on the other side of this um, fence. And I'm going to pick this up and I'm going to pour it through the filter. And as I said, the 600 will catch the really big stuff. And the 200 is at the bottom. 
there's a lot of sediment in the bottom because the microorganisms that have been fed by the molasses and have been multiplied with the compost. See, that's sediment. Yeah, um, it's sludgy. Yeah, it's kind of sludgy. So then what I'll do is I'll pick this one up. And this will probably take a while to drain. Yeah, it might take a while to drain. So we'll be back in a minute. And uh, should we go to questions or the compost tea application? So uh, I have a question is what are the microorganisms and what happens to them after you strain them out? And it looks like we might have lost Teresa again. So I, I can't answer that question, but um, I bet Teresa will be back on. And that is her ringing the bell. <laughs> okay. Can it you... looks like we might have lost Teresa again. Um, I tried this to click on. Can you hear me? I, I can't answer that question, but um, I bet Teresa will be back on. We have some uh, internet gremlins going on with this presentation for Teresa. You're, you're muted, friend. Um. Okay, now I'm on my phone. Yes. <laughs> I turned off my computer and I will take that next question about, what was it? Repeat it, please. Um, so what are microorganisms and what happens to them after you strain them out? Um, well, you actually strain out just the, um, the manure and some of the solids in, in the compost tea. And you can actually use that as an, you know, can add it to your rose bushes, it, 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 it just as you would regular compost. The tea, you want to really distribute that in your garden because, you don't have enough compost. You don't make enough compost to use in every part of your garden. So what the tea does is it extends those microorganisms and um, puts it over a much wider range of area to, um, you know, build the soil. And the microorganisms are fungi and different kinds of um, bacteria that are good for the soil. And um, it helps to feed protozoa and earthworms and things like that. And it's part of the decomposers that makes um, a rich, new, you know, nutrient dense soil basically for plants. Great. Um, do you want to take more questions now or should we watch the applicator video? Let's watch the video. All right. So now we're going to apply our compost tea with a foliar application with this sprayer. And I've got a backpack sprayer that fits five gallons, but there's also a little one or two gallon sprayer that you can use much better than the handheld, you know, sprayers that you would use on plants. This one has a hose and it is much more efficient and puts out large droplets. And you want the tea to go onto the leaves where the microorganisms have multiplied and can cover the leaves and feed nutrients to the plant through the leaves. Um, it's not actually a fertilizer compost tea, um, but it does um, provide some nutrients. And what it does, it just helps build a healthy plant and healthy soil through um, introducing a lot of microorganisms into the soil and the plant. And you can drench too. Like this little tree is a peach tree and it went through a freeze and it's getting the leaves back again but I drenched the soil with some compost tea to help stimulate growth. Is it really about making a microbial system like it is more I diverse mean, or I mean uh, really a healthy micro bacteria healthy bacteria healthy fungi protozoa nematodes all of those things are multiplied in this brew and applied to the plants and therefore will help them uh, uptake nutrients 
and uptake water better through their root system. So it'll provide them a healthier root system. That was great, Teresa. Well, yeah, uh, thank you. You know, I can also equate it kind of as a healthy biome, like the the human gut, and you know, you're putting in good bacteria and, and probiotics and prebiotics. That's what these microorganisms are doing for our soil, and they're like little tiny microscopic animals that are alive, and they're food for the larger decomposers, for the, the centipedes and the millipedes and the earthworms and the nematodes. I forget in like a in one cup of soil, there's something like a trillion living organisms uh, on in healthy soil. And mm -hmm. if you see Teresa's garden that she sprayed it back in May, it's just like exploded. Oh no! I wish I could show you because that was two months ago and what it looks what everything looks like today. Yeah. And you know, I applied it in a different way today. I didn't have time to lo upload a video, but I took five gallons of compost tea that I made over the last 36 hours. And I took a half a barrel of rainwater and I poured that compost tea um, into it after I filtered it. And then I took that filtered manure and I used it around trees and, and rose bushes. But then I put a sump pump in it. And I attached a garden hose to it with a regular garden nozzle, just kind of one of the spray ones. And I just went all over the vegetable garden, all over my roses, all over the berry bushes, the raspberries, the gooseberries, the blackberries. And it's just coated all the leaves and some of the soil too. And that's another way to apply it. So you don't have to get technical with like all this different equipment. Well, this is very technical right here, a, a watering can. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. I didn't use any yeah, and, and the large droplets are important because if you put it into one of these little handheld sprayers like you use on your laundry, it actually, I've read about it, it actually um, doesn't allow the microorganisms to fully get, you know, sprayed onto things. So you want a little bit bigger droplets. Okay. And will that get clogged up, Teresa? Will it clog quickly? Well, what I do is I, and we're going to show you, I think the next video on how you strain it, but did we do that already? Yeah, okay. We, yeah. I, I, I don't have access to the videos or the slides right now on my phone, but um, I use that 200 uh, micro um, film, whatever it's called, the, you know, nylon 200. And that takes out all of the really bigger particles that would spray a uh, clog a nozzle spray. So I like to ultra, you know, filter it. And, and so can, you, can you answer one more question for me? And that is, what is the difference? Why can't I just get a scoop of compost out of my compost bin, put it in water, and then put it on my garden? I mean, okay, you can do that. That's called a brew. So if you're just going to steep a compost, that's fine. You're not going to get the billions of activated good beneficial bacteria that you're going to use with the with the aerated brewer um, but you can do that that will add good nutrients it's just not going to add as much and not need really much the food for those microbes is the molasses that you've added because it's already spent right. most so when you're adding the molasses i guess you're feeding uh, microbes and multiplying right. Right. Yeah, that feeds them. When you're making compost, you do a layer of browns like you do leaves and you put hay in there. Then you do a layer of nitrogen, which are greens, which is like grass clippings and kitchen scraps and um, manure. That's a green. And then I add water or actually I just yeah, I, I, I add uh, water so that, you know, it gets wet because you don't want just a dry compost that won't decompose. Um, and then you add your layers. So each layer is about three or four inches. And by the time you get to the top, you with the manure, you're adding a lot of microorganisms. You can just do it with regular plant material, too. I mean, um, it, you won't have as much of the diverse microorganisms as you would in animal manure. But people do alfalfa meal and they put all kinds of things in that will feed microbes. The molasses feeds microbes. And so does all the other plant material. And you, yeah. 
So Teresa, once you make up the compost tea, how long does it last? Like how can you store it? No. Or you have to use it right away. You have to use it within a few hours. Otherwise oh. it starts to go anaerobic. And because of that, the lack of aeration, it'll go anaerobic and the, the, the aerobic microorganisms will start to die off. So I okay. try to use mine within about three or four hours. And so that would be true if you were to buy the compost tea already made up from your local hardware or garden center. That I don't know because what the tea in or the uh, microbes in this EM1 are actually called faculative microbes. So um, they are stable anaerobic faculative microbes that when you add air to them and food, they turn into ana uh, aerobic. But if you don't use that, then they're anaerobic. It's interesting, but you can look that up. It's, you'll see it on the resource page. Um, and I showed you, it's called Terraganics. And there's a Japanese professor, Professor Higa, back in the 70s and 80s that discovered um, the benefits of, of the, using these microorganisms. And um, there's a lot of research on it. So you should look that up too. So if, if I don't have five gallons of rainwater, can I use tap water and then let it sit to get the chlorine evaporated? 24 hours. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it sounds like having an aerator is critical. And I looked up online to see like, what does an aerator cost? And I see some that are $7 and I see some that are 60. Can you tell us what we should look for with an aerator? Um, I lent Tracy my aerator. So it's, she's got it. And I, you know, don't buy the $5 uh, pump. Really, you want to spend about between 20, about 20 to $30 on a really good pump. I've had that for eight years. I've been using it for eight years. And that's a large stone. It's an aeration stone. And so that the more air you could get into the brew or into the tea, the better. Um, because you might get pockets of, uh, you know, areas that aren't being aerated. So I sometimes just take that PVC pipe or stick or whatever, and I just stir it up a couple times a day, even with the aeration going on. because so I want to make sure that it's well aerated. But you can look into it. I bought mine in an aquatic store and um, I tried different ones to, until I found one that really, really was a strong pump. And it wasn't all that expensive. Um, does the... The my the mycorrhizal inoculant work for compost tea, and I've got uh, an example of. Right. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, mycorrhizal fungi is an inoculant that needs to be in contact with the roots, and it's it's like a mushroom. I mean, it's like a fun fun uh, fungi, and it helps. It, it's symbiotic with roots, so it helps roots take up minerals and and water. Um, potash and all the calcium and all the different minerals. Um, but you cannot put it in the tea because it actually won't be beneficial to the plants. It needs to be in contact with roots. So when I plant my um, tomatoes, I'll, I'll put some of the granules, the inoculant from the mycorrhizal fungi on the roots and plant it. And um, that for some reason, brassicus doesn't benefit from mycorrhizal fungi, but you can also look that up to see which plants uh, benefit. And so you're saying the compost tea is strictly for the, the things above the ground. So stems and leaves and, and thing is how the plant absorbs the benefits. Yes, but you, can, you can do a soil drench. And so you're putting it around the roots. You're just not putting in mycorrhizal fungi, but you are putting in effective organisms that feed other things in the soil and therefore help the plants. So, and for those of us who live in an area that might have raccoons and squirrel, squirrels or bears, does compost tea act as an attractant? You know, I've been using it. I've put probably five uh, compost tea, you know, 25 gallons on this spring. And I haven't had a problem with this. I, I only put in a teaspoon of the fish hydrolysate um, I used to use bone meal or blood meal in my garden. That definitely attracts raccoons. They'll start digging up your bulbs. 
but I haven't had any problem with any animals digging in my garden at, at using this on the on the leaves. I think because it's it's so spread out, um, we we spray it over a larger area. It smells like um, Noel, our daughter's old fish tank water. But when you <laughs> mix the molasses initially, it's um, really so that I was careful to put inside of the shed so it wouldn't attract animals. But once it's finished, it just has a um, old fish tank water smell. I don't think it would attract animals. And I think the kelp adds to that, you know, seaweed smell. But, I, didn't, I didn't put kelp in mine, but yeah. yeah. And you could just make a very simple compost tea, aerated tea. You just use manure or worm compost that's been well composted, uh, dechlorinated water, and molasses. And yeah. you can do that too. You don't have to add all the rest of that stuff. That's just for optimal, nu optimal nutrition. So we also have some other uh, slides that we're going to show and talk a little bit about the garden and, and um, what you can do to help pollinators now that you've compost teed your garden uh, for optimal growth. And Cynthia's going to speak to that. Great. Thanks, Teresa. That was so fascinating. And I loved watching you actually do it so that I can <laughs> try that in my own garden. I um, haven't done those activated ones, so I'm excited to try that. But um, so I'm here to try and make the connection between um, soil and pollinators. What the heck does soil have to do with a bee? That's fine. And so the point is that the entire ecosystem is reliant upon the entire ecosystem. So if you have healthy soils, farmers will say they don't grow plants, they grow soil. Because once you have a healthy soil, you know you're going to have a healthy plant. And so that follows that if you have a healthy plant, you're going to have healthy nutrients for all of the pollinators and something, and, and actually all of the bugs. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize is that um, all of the microorganisms that are in the plant can be accessed by pollinators and insects via the plant's leaves or pollen or nectar. So the plant world is actually the um, pharmacy for all of the insects that live there. So it, everything is interdependent and that is the connection and why we all want to build a healthy ecosystem starting with our soils. So this is just showing some of Deborah's delicious, beautiful organically grown strawberries and the bees happily doing it and the native plants introduced into our gardens will also be beneficial for all those insects that live naturally in our environment. Next slide. So pollinators are something we usually as bee chicas talk about all the different kinds of pollinators we have. But on top of that, we want you to learn to love all the bugs. <laughs> insects are, are so beneficial and there is a balance in our ecosystem with predators and prey. And um, sometimes we wanna just step back and let the ecosystem work for us. And I have a story I usually tell about how I had some yellow jackets nesting, actually it was paper wasps nesting outside my window. And I didn't want them right there where I walk in and out of my kitchen with all my kids and everything. And so, I kept saying, okay, I've got to get rid of that. I've got to get rid of that. I was going to just go knock it down. And I never did. And then one day I looked out my kitchen window and there's a magpie flying at my window. And I thought it was going to just, I thought it was going berserk. It was going to just hit my window, but it was actually taking care of that wasp nest and eating the larva and took care of the paper wasps for me. And um, birds will do that too. There's, um, right now you'll go out and birds are starting to fledge and um, they're eating thousands of caterpillars and worms and all kinds of things that are, um, that are going to their babies to raise them. So you also want to think about um, birds in your ecosystem that actually feed on the insects and the larval stage of insects, especially, which are the things that to your plants that you want to have in balance. 
And can I just add that this is a European paper wasp here, and it might be eating aphids or drinking. Paper wasps, it was eating the aphids off of maybe your basil plants. <laughs> Yes, everything has a purpose, and the goal is actually to have a balanced ecosystem, so not to have um, anything in too much overabundance. Well, and Sin, to your point about the birds, birds feeding um, hatchlings need over 2,000 insects a day, so we need to learn to love bugs because birds need a lot of insects to raise their young. Right. Which means, which means we can even love pests, right? We love those aphids. We love those, whatever, mosquitoes. And they also bring in the beneficial insects. They'll bring in the ladybugs and the praying mantises. So we just need to learn to accept that nature can take care of itself. We don't have to um, try to control everything. And further to Teresa's point, we even want to attract all of those things to our gardens. And so there are many plants that uh, a lot of them are native plants, but a lot of them are, are, are other vegetables or herbs or something, because we have now started to study what feeds the large larval stage of in beneficial insects that we want in our garden. And um, so if you want to attract butterflies, you need to attract the caterpillar, the food for the caterpillar. So obviously the butterfly will come and lay eggs and, um, Dill or fennel is a wonderful um, host plant for all the swallowtails. There's this beautiful black swallowtail that is in the photo, and there's also the yellow swallowtails, and they lay their eggs on um, dill or fennel, and, and then that caterpillar is born and will eat a little bit of the dill or fennel, but not very much. We have plenty with that we can share. And, um, and then we will have those beautiful pollinating butterflies that give us joy in our garden and, and also do some pollination services. And as everybody knows, our poster child, the monarch butterfly, has a specific host plant, um, Asclepius plants. There's, there's several different varieties. And there are, um, I think, three native varieties in Colorado. And you just want to plant the native kind. This is one of the natives called Asclepius tuberosa. And then there's incarnata and another kind as well. Um, and you don't want to plant an invasive milkweed that's not a native. Um, and so I hate the name butterfly weed. It's really such a beautiful plant. It's really not a weed. And it's very well behaved in my garden and a beautiful bright spot among all my other purple plants for my pollinators. I love seeing that um, butterfly plant. So, um, and this is the only, um, Asclepius is the only plant that the um, monarch butterfly can live on and eat and the larval stage can eat. Oh, and this is just a list that you can come back. I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but um, specifically in Colorado, these are the best host plants for some of our native pollinators and butterflies. And um, so like, for instance, the Colorado hair streak is our state butterfly. And it has, it can only live on the gamble oak, which is more native to Southern Colorado, but we can grow it here as well. And so anyway, this, I'll let you peruse that list. But if anybody has any questions, you can, can ask about that. Um, and, and as I said, a lot of the native plants um, are host plants. And we have, if you go to our website, you'll be able to go to um, resources, classes and resources tab um, on beechicas.com. And you can click on our favorites um, plants and you can see a plant list that's organized by bloom time. And, um, and there's also on the end of that, another list of host plants that might be beneficial to you if you want to try to grow more natives. And contrary to popular belief, natives are easy to grow in our home gardens. We have, um, we can grow columbine and we can grow these gentians and sneeze weeds and things. The only difficulty might be trying to find um, sources where you can buy these plants. 
And I really recommend um, getting on the Native Plant Society list and the Denver Botanic Gardens because they have sales where they have um, so many beautiful native plants that and expertise to tell you how to how and where to grow them. And I'll tell you the secret: the key to growing native plants in your garden is guess what? Soil. So if you put the right soil. If you have a construction site that has that terrible debris, basically, in your garden, um, you and you want to improve it, you don't improve it the same way for native plants as you do for, say, um, English cottage garden plants. And so um, we have specific um, soils that are high in granite and, and decomposed granite type of soils. And if you have that soil... And you, or you bring it in and you can buy all the ingredients for that to bring in just like you would bring in planters mix. Um, and if you put that soil there, then you will, um, your native plants will thrive. Okay, and um, we just wanted to, Bee Chicas wanted to acknowledge the struggle that's going on in our community right now and give a great big shout out to Soul Fire Farm, who are doing wonderful things. They're located in upstate New York. They are nurturing soil and they are beekeepers and they're doing lots of great work. Um, and in their own words, they say, they are composting the legal system into a fertilizer for growth. So shout out to the Soul Fire Farm. Um, there's a wealth of information on their website, which is up there. Yeah, and they have some great videos. It's just great to see what they're doing, get educated, and support. Yeah. So our, our young farmers, our young, you know, organic farmers, which they are. Yeah, and they're spreading the word. And there's a lot of great resources online they're they're switching to a lot of their classes and and things online as well so we can benefit from um tuning in and learning um from them as well so and they have beekeeper classes online and soil composting classes online so um what, check it out then what is their website if you just look up look up soul farm fire farm i think okay. it's soulfirefarm.com and you okay. can follow them on Instagram at Soul Fire Farm. Okay. And they have, they, they post some really great things. And we uh, really are, our organization is all about education. And um, I've been learning so much just trying to look into some of their programming. And um, I think we ha all have a lot to learn. So we wanted to put a little plug in for that. And we're about to run out of time, but we just wanted to tell you some other things you can do to work together to make your impact in your own yard go a lot further. And so check out the Boulder Pollinator Garden Project through the City of Boulder's website. And um, of course, join us in the fall when we're having Pollinator Appreciation Month. Uh, we work closely with the City of Boulder and um, and help them run their amazing programs. And it's going to be virtual this year and a lot of resources there as well. Um, so follow along with the City of Boulder's great work. Okay, and Teresa, do you wanna hop in and speak to this? There's some great resources for composting. Okay, well, I can't see the slides for some reason okay. on my phone. But um, the Gaia College, that's the notebook. That's what I mentioned earlier. They have an organic master gardening program. I put some links in there about compost, how to make it, what it is, um, and um, how to maintain it. And then also there's a couple books that I put up there that are really basic um, composting books to get started. And at the very end, there is a video and it shows Phil the Smiling Gardener. He has two, um, two websites. One is 
um, philipsmilinggardener.com. And the other one is Gardener's Pantry. I think it's .ca. They might both be .ca. But um, he sells organic products and, and gives instructional videos. And that's how to make activated, effective microorganisms um, from the bottle I told you that will increase by 20 times the, the bottle that you buy. And I got that on, I ordered it online. Well, do we have time for some questions, Kathy? Um, we, so audience, if you'd like to share your questions in the chat, um, we will put in the description later, once this video is, is um, uploaded to YouTube, we'll put all the links that you saw on that last screen into the chat so that you can easily access that. Um, and Teresa, the, the resources that you mentioned earlier, is this the page that you'd refer people to um, when you were speaking earlier about resources or was it on your website for the compost resources? It's that page, it's the resource. Okay. Great. So we'll definitely we'll definitely upload the the link so you can see that because I know the video doesn't click through like we're used to on PowerPoint. Um, well, Chicas, do you have anything else you'd like to add or questions you think people might be wondering that they just are too shy to put in the chat? <laughs> I would just add that we do have the um, demonstration videos of Teresa up on our website under how to, and so if you want to refer to that, um, you can also um, access the videos via our website, and um, we'll put these resources up there also on bchicas.com. Perfect. And we've linked to both of those in the chat here on YouTube. Great. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to the library. We love working with the Boulder Public Library and are able to do so because of the Library Foundation. So we're grateful to that. So please support the foundation. They are doing some great work for us all. Yes, we were on the roof this morning of the roof of the library, uh, tending to the two beehives uh, that you might see from the bike path in Boulder. That is super exciting. And we will be announcing later Bee Chica workshops on the library's website. If you want to go to boulderlibrary.org. Um, Bee Chicas, thank you so much for inviting us into your homes and guiding us through some steps how to make healthier soils for healthier people and planet. Um, I hope we, we have ways that we can show our uh, bountiful produce with you later in the, later in the season. That would be Thank fun. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Celine, Adam, and the Boulder Library Foundation again, along with everyone who tuned in to watch and ask questions. And finally, if you and our audience know others who would enjoy this event, remember that this has been recorded and will be available to watch on the Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for your work, Bichicas, in making our world a more colorful, tasty, and better place. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Enjoy summer.